Hello, this is Michael Dowd, and this is my main follow-up program when I preach or do a homily in a moderate to liberal Christian church or progressive Christian church, whether it be Catholic or Protestant. The title, Ecotheism, Ecology as the Heart of Theology, Human-Centeredness as Idolatry. I've got several other titles that I've used uh, over the last few months. Faithful to the Future, Reclaiming the Evolutionary Purpose of Religion, also, Inspiring Science, Evolving Faith, The Prodigal Species Comes Home to Reality. And this is a one-hour version of, if I have the opportunity to speak three times, like a lecture series, that sort of thing, where I've got three 45 to 60-minute programs, I typically do these. Reality 101, Big Green History and Deep Time Wisdom, What's Inevitable, What's Futile, What's Divine, and What's Demonic. It's about untrivializing God, guidance, gospel, and good and evil. My second program is Grace Limits 101, Nature, Human Nature, and Death, Staying Sane, Sober, and Centered in Hard Times. It's really about honoring our inner, outer, social, and mortal nature. And then my concluding program, Legacy 101, The Death and Resurrection of Faith, Reclaiming the Evolutionary Purpose of Religion. And I suggest this is the one and only way home for the prodigal species. But what you're watching here is just a one, if I have a one-time shot, the hour, hour and 10 minutes or so, this is the core content. Ecotheism, the prodigal species comes home. Six main topic areas. Nested ecotheism untrivializes God, guidance, gospel, and good and evil. The evolutionary purpose of religion and the religious necessity of science. Big green history, God's time, the cosmic 101-year timeline. Reality speaks. What is God telling us? Reality is inevitable, is futile, and what does it mean to be a Christian in this context? That the death and resurrection of faith, unnatural versus undeniable Christianity, and then concluding with 10 commandments to avoid extinction and redeem humanity. And this reflects collective intelligence that I've gathered over the course of about a year and a half. Loyal Rue is one of the leading philosophers of religion. Uh, some consider him the most significant philosopher of religion alive. One of his books is Religion is Not About God. And what he means is that religion is about our relationship to reality. And yes, reality has been personalized as the various gods or goddesses throughout history or in the monotheistic tradition, the Lord. But if religion is doing its job, it's to help us live in right relationship to what's fundamentally, undeniably, and inescapably real. I love this quote. The most profound insight in the history of humankind is that we should seek to live in accord with reality. Indeed, living in harmony with reality may be accepted as a formal definition of wisdom. If we live at odds with reality, foolishly, we will be doomed. But if we live in proper relationship with reality, wisely, we shall be saved. So whatever else it means to live in right relationship to reality, it's got to include living in right relationship to the air, the water, the soil, and the life of this planet. It's also got to include living in right relationship to future generations. Besides, I love showing off my granddaughter. So I dedicate this program to Isla Renee and to her grandchildren. So ecotheism, ecology as the heart of theology. St. Thomas Aquinas said it really well. He said, a mistake about creation will necessarily result in a mistake about God. Now, he said that 750 years ago. And what this means, among other things, is that the more we learn about creation, the more we learn about the universe, if we're not updating what we mean when we use the word God, we may have definitions and understandings of God that are no longer life-giving. In fact, they may be deadly. So ecotheism is really deep sustainability. It's the opposite of shallow environmentalism. And the fundamental uh, image that I want to leave uh, you with is nested reality, nested divinity, like nesting dolls. See, we now understand the nested nature of reality. And this is, there's no dispute. Subatomic particles within atoms, within molecules, within cells, within organisms, within planets and galaxies. Every level is creative. Every level can bring something new into existence that didn't exist before. And of course, it's much more complicated. We're somewhere in the middle. And God, or primary reality, is everything within us, 
that's required for our existence and everything around us that's required for our existence. And you can imagine the smallest and the largest nesting dolls being infinite in either direction. It's the opposite of a mechanistic universe, the idea that nature is a complex clock and God is merely the clockmaker outside a clockwork universe. And of course, Martin Buber, the famous Jewish theologian, spoke decades ago that if we don't have an I-thou relationship to primary reality, we will go extinct. We cannot survive an I-it relationship where we think that the living world is merely an it to be used and exploited by us. So ecotheism, right relationship to reality, that is right relationship to God's living presence, God's blue-green presence, you could say, God's local presence in this universe and here in this ecosystem. Thomas Berry was my great mentor, uh, and he was one of the most significant ecological and evolutionary thinkers of the 20th century. And this quote just sets the context for what I'll be talking about. We are talking only to ourselves. We are not talking to the rivers. We are not listening to the wind and the climate. Most of the disasters that are happening now are a consequence of that spiritual autism. Now, I think one of the reasons why he speaks about us being spiritually autistic, or blind and deaf to what God's been revealing through evidence, is that we haven't acknowledged and appreciated what may be one of the most important scientific discoveries about religion, or to use religious language, one of the most important revelations about religion in the last several hundred years which is that our brains are inherently relational and we relate through what's called personification. That is, we give human characteristics to what's more than human, what's other than human. Wendell Berry understood the power of personification. He said, nature is party to all our deals and decisions, and she has more votes, a longer memory, and a sterner sense of justice than we do. Now, James Hillman, one of the most famous and well-known psychologists of the last 50, 70 years, uh, he said that you can't understand the world's myths and religions if you don't understand our brain's propensity to give human characteristics to what's more than human. He said, loving is a way of knowing, and for love to know, it must personify. Personifying is thus the heart's mode of knowing. It's not a lesser, primitive way of apprehending, but a finer one. To enter myth, we must personify, and to personify carries us into myth. Now, he's not meaning by myth an untrue story. He's meaning it the way Joseph Campbell did, a narrative that puts us in accord with the nature of reality. Now, fortunately, Hollywood and Conservation International have gotten the memo on personification, and they've created uh, over the last several years about 15 or 16 of these one- to two-minute videos that personify some aspect of reality. Some Hollywood star uh, gives voice to some aspect of reality, and you really get the power of personification. Uh, here's just one example. This is Julia Roberts not speaking about nature. She's nature speaking. Now notice how different that stance is, that nature doesn't need people. People need nature. From the idea that nature is uh, some cute bunny that needs our protection. It's a profound shift. So I encourage you to go to natureispeaking.org. There's, again, 15, 16 of these. They're all just one or two minutes. And, of course, God's voice includes all of these. Otherwise, it's not God or it's not reality that we're talking about. Now, we don't know of a single culture anywhere in the world that didn't personify or personalize the climate and what the climate was doing as divine judgment or divine blessing. And it's not a surprise. I mean, can you think of any force in the universe that more consistently brings cultures into existence, sustains them, and destroys them than climate? Right relationship to reality is fundamentally what matters for all species. This is true for, as true for humans as it is for any other species. So when I use the word God, either cap, all caps or small caps or the old English spelling, the way that a number of Catholic nuns and feminists are doing, which is sort of a gender neutral way of spelling, but it's the old English spelling of God. Either way, what I'm meaning is reality with a personality, not a person outside reality. Now, whenever I speak in colleges or university settings, I can always count on some philosophy major to challenge me and say, well, what do you mean by reality? And I love Philip K. Dick's definition. He says, reality is that which, when you stop believing in it, doesn't go away. And whatever else that includes, time is real, whether we believe in it or not. And nature is real, whether we believe in it or not. So I say time plus, nature plus. Plus what? Well, plus at least a voice. And plus anything you want to believe. 
in, a, in terms of supernatural or otherworldly, anything that you want to believe, but God includes or is incarnate or present or revealed or expressed within time and within nature. Again, otherwise it's not reality that we're talking about. So reality with a personality. This includes the power, the collective intelligence, and the voice of the universe plus. And it also includes the real presence and the guidance of past, present, and future. So again, if the word God is not including the power, a collective intelligence, and voice of the universe, and if it's not including the real presence and the guidance of past, present, and future, then we have a trivial, impotent, otherworldly, unbelievable notion of God. God is inescapably real when we look at God this way. This is ecotheism. For example, I'm going to use secular language and religious language, and you're going to see both are totally legitimate. You can't understand how reality or God created complex life if you don't understand extinctions. You can't understand how reality or God created the Great Lakes or soil in the northern part of the world if you don't understand glaciers. You can't understand how God or reality created the periodic table of elements or planets or life or even the atoms of our bodies if you don't understand red giants and supernova explosions. Watch this photo carefully. You surely can't understand how God or reality created continents and oceans and mountains if you don't understand plate tectonics. See, we don't believe that the Atlantic Ocean is growing at the same rate that our fingernails grow. We know it. We've got the satellites to measure exactly how fast the Atlantic Ocean is growing and how fast the Pacific Ocean is shrinking. This is evidential knowledge. So back in 2014, I did a TEDx talk, the second TEDx talk that I did called Reality Reconciles Science and Religion. And this was an attempt to show that the word reality didn't exist 2000 years ago. So what we mean by reality was captured by mythic language, divine language. And I would suggest that the theism versus atheism debate is a form of collective insanity. Post-theism, too, makes sense only if you start with an idolatrous, that is, an impotent, finite, otherworldly notion of God. No sane person would say, I don't believe in reality, or I don't believe in the universe. I mean, you've got millions of people debating whether or not God is real or whether or not God exists when the one real God, namely reality, personified or not, we've been living out of right relationship to, and we are now about to experience consequences of biblical proportion. And people are debating whether or not God is real or whether or not God exists. It's insane. St. Anselm famously described God as that which nothing greater can be imagined. Well, any God who merely transcends time and nature is less than a God who transcends and includes time and nature. So one is a finite, limited, and unnatural understanding of God, and the other is an infinite, unlimited an undeniable understanding of God, whether you spell it with capital letters or G-O-D-D-E or whatever. See, here's humanity. We're in the middle somewhere. We're made up of smaller creative realities that we couldn't exist without, like our microbiome. And we're also part of larger creative realities. We couldn't exist without the trees that create the, uh, the oxygen for us and, and, and animals and so forth. So God is primary reality, a sacred proper name for that one and only creative reality in which we live and move and have our being. And it's also within us. And again, you can imagine these going infinite in both directions. <laughs> That's what science, as science has been getting smaller and smaller and smaller, they keep finding smaller things. And now they're talking about, you know, multiple universes. Well, it can go infinitely either direction. But this cosmos is divine. So the cosmos, you could say, is God's universal self or God's local self. The biosphere is God's living presence. And facts interpreted collectively are God's evidential word. So when I speak about the untrivializing or the realizing of God, guidance, and gospel, this is, this is what I'm meaning. That any notion of God that is not synonymous with reality is anti-future and ultimately self-terminating. Any understanding of scripture or God's word or divine revelation that doesn't include all forms of evidence, scientific, historic, cross-cultural, and personal, interpreted collectively, is anti-future and self-terminating. 
any theology that doesn't include ecology, the interdisciplinary study of primary reality or God's nature, is anti-future and self-terminating. And any understanding of the gospel that's merely cosmic fire insurance is anti-future and self-terminating. I mean, is this really the good news that we get to avoid being tortured forever? Is that what the gospel has been reduced to? I mean, even the United States Department of Defense defines terrorism as the calculated use of violence or the threat of violence to inculcate fear intended to coerce or intimidate others in the pursuit of goals that are generally religious, political, or ideological. So thinking of God as a cosmic terrorist is not inspiring and it's not accurate. That's not the way reality is structured. So here's the heart of ecotheism. God must include the power, presence, and voice of reality. Scripture must include all forms of evidential collective intelligence. Theology must include ecology, the scientific study of God's nature. And the gospel, or good news, must include life in and for this world. Human-centered measures of progress, well-being, and good news are anti-future and self-terminating. Only life-centered, that is, ecocentric or God-centered measures of success are faithful to the future. So coming back to this notion of ecotheism, ecology as the heart of theology, when I speak of human-centeredness, specifically human-centered hubris, the idea of man, conqueror of nature, as idolatry, this is what I'm pointing to. In fact, these two quotes capture it. My two great mentors, or two of my great mentors, uh, William Catton, the author of Overshoot, many of us consider the most important book of the 20th century, certainly the single most important book that Connie and I have ever read, and Thomas Berry, author of both The Dream of the Earth and The Great Work, Our Way into the Future, and several other books. But these quotes just really capture the essence of why human-centeredness is idolatry. Human society is inextricably part of a global biotic community, and in that community, human dominance has had and is having self-destructive consequences. Along similar lines, Thomas Berry writes, the most difficult transition to make is from an anthropocentric to a biocentric norm of progress. If there is to be any true progress, then the entire life community must progress. Any so-called progress of the human at the expense of the larger life community must ultimately lead to a diminishment of human life itself. So, moving to the evolutionary significance of religion and the religious significance of science. David Sloan Wilson and Edward O. Wilson, they're not related, but they are two of the leading evolutionary theorists. They're probably the, the two leading evolutionary theorists alive. Uh, Ed Wilson's probably the most famous scientist alive. He's written two Pulitzer Prize winning books. David Sloan Wilson is probably the most effective per person on the planet for bringing conservative religious people into a mainstream evolutionary understanding of reality. And both of them have furthered this idea of the evolutionary significance of religion and the religious significance of science. But what I want to talk about here is a distinction that David Sloan Wilson makes, the distinction between practical truth or practical knowledge or practical realism and factual truth or factual knowledge and factual realism. See, throughout human history, practical truth is if I act as if, if my culture acts as if these these beliefs are true, we experience personal wholeness, social coherence, and ecological integrity. In other words, right relationship with God, group, and self. Factual truth is what science specializes in, but factual truth has to be interpreted so that it's also practically true. Otherwise, we'll destroy ourselves, as some of the technology is now leading us to do. And in an evolutionary competition, practical truth will outcompete factual truth every day. So speaking of the evolutionary purpose of religion and the religious necessity of science, well, there are not a lot of books that I could point to. I also mentioned, I already mentioned, uh, Loyal Rue's book, Religion is Not About God. This book, Supernatural as Natural, a biocultural approach to religion. And then Teddy Goldsmith, Edward Goldsmith, The Stable Society, which is one of the most important books on the distinction between sustainable cultures and unsustainable cultures. And then his magnum opus, The Way, an ecological worldview that he worked on for decades. Teddy Goldsmith was the editor and the um, uh, 
publisher of The Ecologist magazine for over 35 years. I love this quote. It may not be irrelevant to note that even very modest forms of life, like earthworms, dung beetles, and fiddler crabs, have no trouble identifying the real problems they must deal with if they are to survive. So Teddy Goldsmith defined religion as the control mechanism of stable, sustainable societies. In other words, if religion is doing its job, it's ensuring that the future is never compromised by the present. And there are three things that virtually every religious culture that was sustainable, every society, culture that was sustainable, these three things were held in common. That all benefits and all real wealth come from the living biosphere, or God, or whatever their sacred personification or name for God was. That God or reality will only continue to dispense these benefits and wealth if life's critical order, that is, its essential integrity or way, is honored and preserved like what the the Chinese call the Tao, the way of life, the way things really are, that humans need to align with that. And thus, the fundamental role of religion, or life ways, is to ensure that the future is never compromised by the present by fiercely preserving the integrity of the ecosphere and the critical order of the cosmos. That is the way. And this was done through four primary ways. God first, seventh generation, sacred limits, and consequence capture. And the reason there's exclamation points after each is because these were enforced upon pain of death or being ostracized. God first, meaning that ecocentric or life-centered, not human-centered, not anthropocentric measures of progress and success. Seventh generation, that failing to prioritize the future over the present is evil. It's inviting future generations to judge what we do in the present by how it will impact them. Sacred limits, that material grace limits are real and must be honored. There's a limit to how much we can take from the living world and how, how much waste we can exude to the living world before the systems start breaking down. These are sacred limits, grace limits. And consequence capture, that is the impact for good or ill, must be mirrored back to individuals and groups of individuals. One of the most important things we need to do now is to ensure that Individuals, corporations, and nation states that have a positive impact on the larger body or on the future, are in, are, are benef- they benefit, they're, they're rewarded, so they're incentivized to do as much good as possible. And individuals, corporations, and nations that have a negative impact on the larger body of life or on the future are harmed or taxed or penalized or there's moral strictures so that it's in their self-interest to do the right, just, ecological thing, and it's also in their self-interest to not do the unjust unecological thing. Right now, we have the incentives all cattywampus. It's possible and profitable for individuals and groups to get wealthy, mega wealthy, in ways that harm the larger body and harm the future. This is insane. And I I think of all of these identically. Pro-future, pro-nature, God-first, eco-theist, and Christian is pro-future. All of those I, I use synonymously. And this was embodied in our own preamble to the uh, United States Constitution. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, and promote the general welfare and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. It's what Thomas Jefferson called usufruct. U-S-U-F-R-U-C-T, which is the land and water should never be used in ways that harm the future, that are, that are not passed on to the future. So these two questions, what's real or how things are, and what's important or which things matter, these are the two fundamental questions that every culture, every society needs to address. And religion 1.0, I call eco-animism, this is the sort of the first 97, 98% of human history, where we went to for, the, for our authoritative source of guidance for what's real and what's important, was the authority of the elders, the tribal elders. They carried the collective intelligence of how to live in right relationship to God, group, and self. Religion 2.0 is the authority of scripture, and scripture-based civilizations are almost always prone to overshoot. Uh, or idolatry, because it's, so, it's almost inevitable to make an idol of the written scriptures because you're no longer present to what God, reality, is revealing through all forms of evidence and experience. 
Religion 3.0, if we survive this bottleneck, it will be because we have come back to God, to reality. I call it ecotheism. It's the authority of evidence, all forms of evidence, scientific, historic, and cross-cultural evidence, including the evidence of our own experience. And this doesn't mean that we shouldn't continue to value the wisdom of elders and the wisdom of Scripture. We should, but we should never allow those to override the larger global collective intelligence, the wisdom of evidence. So, Patriarch Bartholomew, Pope Francis, the Dalai Lama, these are major religious leaders that are at the forefront of what I'm calling the evidential reformation. That is where we value evidence as more authoritative than old men and old books. So the unique and necessary role of religion is to ensure ecological integrity, social coherence, and personal wholeness in that order that is right relationship to God, group, and self. And to do this, typically what religions have needed to do is to name good and evil. Good is what promotes ecological integrity, social coherence, and personal wholeness. Evil is what diminishes or destroys ecological integrity, social coherence, and personal wholeness. This is not moral rocket science or theological rocket science. So a reality-based or eco-theist view of good and evil is the shift from human-centeredness to life-centeredness. Aldo Leopold said it very powerfully. He said, a thing is right when it tends to preserve the diversity, stability, and beauty of the life community. A thing is wrong when it tends otherwise. Thomas Berry famously said, given humanity's huge and devastating impact on the larger body of life, our predicament and our way into the future can be summarized in three sentences. The glory of the human has become the desolation of the earth. Yeah, things have gotten better and better for many humans, certainly the richest of us, but at a dis diminishing planet. The desolation of earth is now our greatest shame and biggest threat. Therefore, all programs, policies, activities, and institutions must henceforth be judged primarily by the extent to which they inhibit, ignore, or foster a mutually enhancing human-earth relationship. My down-to-earth way of saying this third sentence is from now on everything needs to be discerned by whether it's pro-future or anti-future. All of our programs, policies, activities, institutions, philosophies, theologies, voting practices, and so forth. Are they helping us to be a blessing to the future or, or, or are they causing us to live as a curse to the future? The fundamental distinction of our time isn't left or right, liberal or conservative, communist, capitalist, none of that stuff. It's pro-future or anti-future. Good people are dangerous and great people will engage in great evil when their God is not synonymous with reality or when their map of reality is outdated by privileging ancient mythic texts over current evidential revelation. But good people are also dangerous and will engage in great evil when they hold the ecocidal and self-terminating belief that we are destiny's darlings, masters of the universe, conquerors of nature, God's chosen species, or the pinnacle of evolution. So shifting to the big picture, from human-centeredness to God-centeredness, that is, this is, from a, this is not a human-centered understanding of time and nature, the big picture. This is a God-centered, life-centered understanding. God's time, that is billions of years, makes a mockery of anthropocentrism or human-centeredness. Thankfully, God's nature, that is the living biosphere, reveals the one and only way home for the prodigal species. Our best global evidential understanding of the past, that is cosmic, biological, and human history, interpreted collectively, is God's word for today. And failing to recognize and honor this is one of the main causes of problems and suffering. Facts are God's native tongue, and trends are God's bullhorn. So just to review where we've come from. So here that we just covered nested ecotheism untrivializes God, guidance, gospel, good and evil. And the evolutionary purpose of religion is, of course, to ensure that the future is never compromised by the present. And the religious necessity of science is to ensure that we have a current understanding of what reality is revealing to us is, is our way forward. 
Now let's take a look at big green history, that is God's time, billions of years, the cosmic 101 year timeline. And what is God, what is reality telling us clearly is inevitable, is futile, and then what does it mean to be a Christian in this context? So big green history, it's also known as the great story or the epic of evolution, the universe story. It's the story that includes all stories. It's physical evolution, biological evolution, and cultural evolution as our first and only globally produced evidence-based creation story. And here, uh, David Christian is one of the founders of the big history movement. Um, he's a dear friend and colleague of ours. This is a TED TED Talk that he delivered, notice that over 11 million people have watched this. I highly recommend it. But big history needs to be tempered by green history. Uh, here we've got a new green history of the world by Clive Ponting, the environment and the collapse of great civilizations, um, also sometimes known as environmental history. And then William Catton's uh, most important book, Overshoot, The Ecological Basis of Revolutionary Change. If big history doesn't incorporate this ecological understanding that William Catton offers and this understanding of green history or environmental history, that is where the environment is not just the backdrop for human history, but it's an active agent, um, then big history actually can steer us in a techno-utopian uh, direction that's, that's totally non-sustainable. So that's why it has to be big green history. So the great story, the epic of evolution, the big history, big green history, um, it's the story that includes all stories and honors all stories. Edward O. Wilson famously said that the evolutionary epic is probably the best myth that we will ever have. Joanna Macy is one of my, probably the my single most profound female mentor. She said, there is science now to construct the story of the journey that we have made on this earth, the story that connects us with all beings. Right now, we need to remember that story, to harvest and to taste it, for we are in a hard time, and it is the knowledge of the bigger story that is going to carry us through. So just for ease of conception, uh, ease of understanding, I've compressed the 14 or 13.82, let's round it off, to 14 billion year history of the universe into 100 years. So if we make 14 billion years equals 100 years, at that time scale, every decade equals 1.4 billion years. Each year is 140 million years. Each week is 2.8 million years. Each day is roughly 400,000 years. Obviously, I'm rounding these off. Each hour is roughly 17,000 years. Each minute is 250 years. And each second on the cosmic century timeline is just under five years. So at that time scale, at day two, all the hydrogen was formed. Early galaxies in the first 20 or 30 years, including our Milky Way, and then the bigger galaxies keep gobbling up or uh, bringing other galaxies into their orbit and then becoming larger as a result. Supernovas and red giants, this is what creates the periodic table of elements and metal-rich stardust that everything else can be created out of. Our solar system forms at 67. Earth cools below the boiling point of water at 69, and it rains for eons, and the only new water that's been added are some icy comets that have come in. At 71, Earth comes alive, and at 72, some of these bacteria learn to feed on the photons of the sun. We call this photosynthesis. And then you got this whole complexification of life, what we call biological evolution, but I don't want to, I'm not going to go through the details of that. What I want to cover is the last four and a half years, the last four and a half years on this cosmic century timeline. That is the last 550 million years related to temperature specifically. Now on the left-hand side, you've got degrees Celsius. On the right-hand side, you've got degrees Fahrenheit. And this is a logarithmic chart, so it's easy to misread it but it works just fine for our purposes because this line here is the baseline 1960 to 1990 temperature average. Here we have the 17 glacial periods, the 17 times that the glaciers have come south and the glaciers have gone back over the course of the last two and a half million years of human existence. And these are driven largely by what's called the Milankovitch cycles, that is the earth wobbling like a top in uh, very predictable ways. Now, there, was, there were Milankovitch cycles long before two and a half million years ago, but there weren't glaciers because it takes carbon parts per million to be lower than 250 for there to be glaciers. 
So anybody who says that we're going to see glaciers again anytime soon doesn't know what they're talking about. Not until carbon parts per million falls below 250, or often below 200, will we see glaciers again. So this is God's evidential revelation. This is, this is evidence-based scripture, modern-day scripture. And here's the projection in 35 to 50 years and in 80 to 100 years. Now, how can we trust those numbers? How can we trust these projections? Well, let's look at what God has revealed over the last 800,000 years through evidence of CO2 levels, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The red line is Hawaii. The blue line are the ice cores in the South Pole. The reason you've got the going up and down is because that's winter and summer. Here's 350, which 350.org is trying to get us back to. Where were you in 1990? So notice there's no pause. There's no going back. This is very consistent. It's continuing to rise. And we know that heat increases as this is the case. We are now at about 410 parts per, parts per million. So now we go back in time. Here we see the pre-industrial average was 278 parts per million. Now we're back 2,000 years. Now we go back further in time. We start going back to the ice ages. The ice age average was about 185 parts per million. Now here we have, over the course of the last 800,000 years, we have eight distinct ice ages. Here's another chart that shows the same thing. Here we are at 410 parts per million. And what we know, what God has revealed through evidence, is that CO2 concentration, global temperature, and sea level rise all march in lockstep. Now, sometimes one leads and sometimes another one leads, but they all march in lockstep. So we know that it's only a matter of time, and it's not going to be too much longer, before global temperature rises and sea level rises, co corresponding to the incredible rise in CO2 concentration. So... The reason that we can have confidence in these numbers is because the last time that carbon parts per million were between 400 and 500 parts per million, um, sea level was 50 to 150 feet higher than now. That's an average of 3 to 10 miles further inland. And of course, places like Bangladesh and many islands were completely inundated. And temperature was 2 to 5 degrees Celsius. That's 4 to 9 degrees Fahrenheit higher than now. Humans have never lived in that kind of a world. We don't know whether we can survive and thrive in that kind of a world. So coming back here to our timeline, where is human history in this? On a 100-year timeline, what's human history? Well, it's the last week of a 100-year timeline. You've got 99 years and 51 weeks, and the very last week of a 100-year timeline is the totality of human existence. Homo habilis, walking upright, using stone tools, 2.8 million years ago, is roughly on December 25th of the 99th year. So during this time, we have climate change, Milankovitch cycles, asteroids and supervolcanoes, plate tectonics, which of course is what creates volcanoes and tsunamis. And what I call religion 1.0 is eco-animism. This is hunting and gathering. We are organized at the scale of families, clans, and tribes. You could say that this is life in the garden with God. Everything we associate with civilization are the last 40 minutes or less. Agriculture, chiefdoms and kingdoms, city-states, empires, writing, religion 2.0, religions of the book, industrialism. This is just the last 40 minutes or less on this cosmic century timeline. That is from 11.20 p.m. until midnight. If the beginning of the universe is one second after midnight on January 1st of the year zero, and right now is December 31st, right at midnight, just about to go into the January 1st uh, of the 100th year, at that time scale, okay, we're talking about the last 40 minutes is civilization. And if we survive, which we may not, there's no guarantee that we will, we could easily have already crossed certain tipping points. But I believe that we will survive, and I believe that we will come back to God, come back to reality. And it will be because we have come back to religion 3.0, or, or, or gone to religion 3.0, which is eco-animism. The ecozoic era is the way that Thomas Berry and Brian Swim, a physicist who worked very closely with Thomas Berry, talked about it. The ecotechnic societies, where technology helps us live in a mutually enhancing relationship 
with the living biosphere upon which we depend. Permaculture, global. Agroecology, global. And notice, you've heard people say, well, we're not going to go back to living in the Stone Age. Well, what if we talked about it? Well, we're not going to go back to living in the garden. In other words, how we language things matters. The Stone Age is only that time before we started mining and using metals. If you want a, vis a visual image that most of us have experienced in terms of Stone Age life, that is for most of human history, just think of Dances with Wolves, the movie Dances with Wolves, and how the indigenous peoples were portrayed there. That's life in the Stone Age. It's life in the garden with God. Which doesn't, not to say that it's perfect, but it's, it's, it's at least honoring of primary reality. Here's the last hour, the last 17,000 years, that is from 11 p.m. until midnight on December 31st of the 99th year. Um, until about 11.20 p.m., we lived more or less sustainably. Horticulture, permaculture 1.0, you could say sustainable agriculture. We start seeing totalitarian agriculture, that is complete human-centeredness, where we no longer care about any other species but our own, about 11.20 p.m., 10,000 years ago. Chiefdoms and kingdoms at 11.30 p.m. City-states and writing at 11.40 p.m., that is about 5,000 years ago. Empires. The Axial Age, that is the great religious traditions of the last 2,500 years, just the last 10 minutes. And we know of about 32 civilizations that have risen and become great, and then their own greatness becomes their own undoing, and they collapse. And it typically takes somewhere between two and 500 years to become great and one or two centuries to collapse. We've seen that happen at least 32 times over the course of this period from 11.35 p.m. just until now, essentially. Uh, a clock make a clockmaker god that is a clockwork universe and an ecocidal that is a, 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 a self-terminating understanding of God not only unsustainable but self-destructive understanding of God God is a clockmaker outside a clockwork universe that if you believe in the clockmaker you're a theist and if you disbelieve in the clockmaker you're an atheist and both sides are denying the, the living presence of the biosphere as divine and that we need to live in right relationship to the ecosphere, whatever name we might give to it. And then industrial rape and plunder. We call it industrialization or the industrial revolution, but it's really the industrial rape and plunder, the defiling of primary reality just in the last minute on this cosmic century timeline. So I consider the last 30 to 40 minutes the age of idolatry, that is the age of human-centeredness. So what is reality telling us? What is God's evidential word in terms of what's inevitable, what's futile, and what does it mean to be a Christian in this context, a follower of Christ in this context? Well, coming back to our time scale here, what can we say with confidence that we can expect in the next minute, that is the next 250 years, Given trends, given what's been unfolding for the last two and a half million years in terms of human experience, and of course, uh, the last uh, 10,000 years of, of uh, agriculture and so forth, what can we say with confidence that we can expect that's either inevitable or, or highly likely in the next 250 years? Well, before we even go there, let's take a look further out to the next year. There will be and another 140 million years. That is, we will see, not we will see, we won't see, but there will be a 101st year. That is about 140 million years from now. And during this time, climate change will continue. The Milankovitch cycles will continue. Asteroids and supervolcanoes, plate tectonics. These volcanoes, tsunamis, these have been happening and these are going to continue happening for the foreseeable future for millions and millions and millions of years. And so one of the things that gives me hope, truly, is that the worst case scenario, let's say we see World War III and it goes nuclear and uh, humans go extinct, many species go extinct with us and all of our nuclear power plants melt down. One of the things that gives me hope is that worst case scenario, by early February, that is 12 million years from now, Earth will have fully recovered. And that gives me hope because we're not going to see worst case scenario. We're just not. We're not that stupid. Connie, my wife, thinks that raccoons will be the second technological species, that is, the second creature that comes to know that it knows. 
because they have the manual dexterity, of course, to create tools. Dolphins are really smart, but they can't create tools to extend their powers and senses. And one of our uh, friends and mentors uh, in this movement, John Michael Greer, one of our favorite authors, uh, he, he agrees with Connie. He thinks that raccoons or the descendants of the ra raccoons, you know, uh, 20 or 30 million years from now are likely to be the, the next self-reflexive intelligence. And he thinks that the third technological species are likely to be the descendants of the crows some 100 million years from now. And the thing is that the, the descendants of the crows, because they're into flying and because fossil fuels will have been replenished by that time, they're going to get to the moon. And the great existential crisis, but also the great humbling, it turns out that hubris is the downfall of virtually every civilization. So the humbling that the crows will need is that they're going to get to the moon and realize that some now extinct Earth species beat them to it. And maybe they don't have a favored relationship with whatever their crow uh, description of God or reality is. And that will be the humbling that they need. So coming back to this next minute, the next 250 years, what can we say confidently is inevitable or highly likely in the next 250 years? And this is in the best case and medium case intergovernmental panel on climate change scenarios. The worst case scenario is we go extinct. There will be climate chaos. There'll be bigger storms, droughts, growing deserts, more wildfires, bigger wildfires, and shifts in where we can grow food and where we can live. This is now inevitable. There'll be a toxic legacy, chemical and nuclear wastes. Um, many communities will not be able to afford to move their, uh, their um, waste away from the oceans, and there's going to be a contamination of many ocean shorelines. Sea levels will rise 25 to 40 feet or more over the course of time. And we'll see the sixth great mass extinction. We're already in the sixth great mass extinction and an end of the fossil fuel era. This is all inevitable in the next 250 years. In fact, scientists who deal with the oceans, uh, for example, John Englander, who is the former president of the Jacques Cousteau Society and written one of the best books on, on uh, the oceans, High Tide on Main Street, he said that if humans went extinct tonight, if some virus wiped us out tonight, that the seas would continue to rise for the next 250 years, at least 25 to 40 feet. And there's not a scientist that deals with the oceans that would disagree with that. Population will shrink to less than a billion due to drought, famine, war, and living in a post-antibiotic age. We're within 20 or 30 years of living in a post-antibiotic age where the, where the microbes have out evolved us and people can die of basic infections as we did before the 1930s. Infrastructures deteriorating in the mass migration of people, plants, and animals. What's happening now in Syria and other parts of the world is just the beginning. Uh, Mexico is expected to be, much of Mexico, almost like the Sahara Desert. Where do you think those people are going to go? They're going to go north, they're going to go south. The end of the American empire. We're within 10 seconds on this cosmic century timeline. Uh, that is 50 years or much less um, of the American empire. That is where 5 or 6% of the world's population benefit from 30%, 25 to 30% of the world's resources. Um, this is going to go bye-bye. And the long descent of industrial civilization. It's a stair step. You know, we talk about the collapse of the Roman Empire. It took over 300 years in a stair-step form, and there were partial recoveries. That's the way civilizations contract. But denial will reign. Most people will not believe any of this. The death of techno-idolatry, the anti-future religion of everlasting growth and human-centered progress on a finite planet. We'll see the death of that. That's inevitable. Here's the good news, salvage and, and ecotechnic societies. Long after we no longer have the energy to mine metals and minerals, we've got tons of metals and minerals in all of our cities that just need to be repurposed. And ecotechnic societies where, we, where our technology helps us live in a mutually enhancing right relationship to primary reality. Permaculture, as I said before, global. Agroecology, global. And as Richard Heinberg talks about, Relocalization. All roads lead local. And millions of people will live meaningful and fulfilling lives and die peacefully and leave a sweet legacy. In other words, this sounds real scary, and it is from a human-centered perspective. But 
What we know in the collapse of previous civilizations is that we typically see 80% of the best of humanity and 20% of the worst of humanity. Yes, we do see a lot of bad stuff, but we also see people come together and support each other in ways that they've never done before. Um, or they don't do typically in rich and uh, times when we don't need each other. I mean, think about it from young men. Uh, there are millions and millions of young men. Not just It's not just men and women too, but especially it's a problem in America, China, India, European, European Union. Uh, young men are addicted to internet porn and internet gaming. And yet that won't be the case when their communities need them. It's going to be the, the salvation, if you will, of an entire generation of young men. Civilizations are built on either a human-centered foundation or on a God-centered or ecocentric, life-centered foundation. And it makes all the difference in the world in terms of how you deal with primary reality, that is the basic energy and biophysical reality, whether you relate to this in a secular way or in a divine or sacred way. And then everything that's built on that, all the things that every society and culture builds upon that foundation are consistent with those basic fundamental principles. It's one of the reasons why there's not a single example in the history of humanity in the last 7,000 years, for example, of civilizations or 6,000 years of civilizations. There's no example of an unsustainable civilization shifting in time to become sustainable. They all collapse because of this chart here. You can't, you can't shift things up at the top of the pyramid and think it's going to make a difference. You've got to basically collapse and then rebuild from a God-centered, life-centered, ecocentric uh, understanding of reality. William Ophels is one of our mentors, and he's probably the leading thinker in the bringing ecology into politics and into uh, governance. He says, sustainability, as usually understood, is an oxymoron. Industrial man has used the found wealth of the new world and the stocks of fossil hydrocarbons to create an anti-ecological titanic. Making the deck chairs recyclable, painting them red or blue, feeding the boilers with biofuels, and every other effort to transform or green the Titanic will ultimately fail. In the end, the ship is doomed by the laws of thermodynamics and by implacable biological and geological limits that are already beginning to bite. We shall soon be obliged to trade in the Titanic for a schooner. In other words, a post-industrial future that, however technologically sophisticated, resembles the pre-industrial past in many important respects. So what can we confidently say that reality is telling us is futile? We don't want to invest time and energy in what's futile. Well, hoping for perpetual progress, imminent apocalypse, or if we all just... These are the three most common delusions that we see in contracting societies. Perpetual progress is never the case. Imminent apocalypse is never the case. And everybody doesn't unite around a particular vision. It just doesn't happen. However, most people go to those one of those three places. So it's also futile to expect your loved ones to not hope or believe in one of these three delusions. Assuming that technology or the market can sustain what is unsustainable. Faith in the techno-narcissistic religion of everlasting growth on a finite planet. This is futile. Expecting your instincts, your unchosen nature, to not at least occasionally challenge you and others. This is evolutionary psychology, evolutionary brain science. For about five years, I did programs just on that. Also denying that mortality and death are real and necessary, individually and as a species. Expecting religion or society to repent of human centeredness prior to collapse. It's not going to happen. Expecting industrial civilization and global capitalism to run on renewable energy. It's possible that renewable energy could support a form of civilization, but just not this form of civilization. And then mistaking the end of the world as we know it for the end of the world, full stop. See, sanity and insanity is not just an individual thing. That is, thinking in right relationship to reality, sanity, or thinking that's out of right relationship to reality, uh, or at cross-purposes of reality, insanity. This is also a collective phenomenon. Here's a visual image of what I call collective insanity. This was last summer in Oregon. I love this quote from Robert Louis Stevenson. 
Sooner or later, we all sit down to a banquet of consequences. That's the great reckoning. Humanity has been out of right relationship to reality, and we are now about to experience severe consequences. And it's not because some supernatural being is pissed off at us. It's because there's consequences when we live out of right relationship to reality. Inescapable consequences. However, this could also be the great homecoming. Humanity, the prodigal species, after squandering our inheritance, waking up to our predicament in the pig pen, as it were, and coming home to God, coming home to reality. Now, in my opinion, especially deserving of compassion and generosity, and I say Christian because this is pro-future, Christ-like compassion and generosity, poor people, communities, and nations who will suffer the most from climate and ecological breakdowns, yet who contributed the least to its main causes. Those of us feeling the loneliness of having to navigate our own downshifting expectations, whilst families, friends, and maybe even spouses are in denial. Individuals, couples, children, families, and communities of our fellow social and mammalian species who generally feel and suffer just like we do. Techno-optimists and free market fundamentalists who will remain in denial the longest and be hardest hit emotionally and financially when reality bites. Religious, political, and social liberals and progressives whose faith in the religion of perpetual progress is currently being shaken shattered or abandoned and religious conservatives and evangelicals whose faith in the Bible has blinded them to what God has revealed through facts about our inner outer social and mortal nature and who thus struggle disproportionately with addiction teen pregnancy domestic violence depression suicide and sin in general pro future Christian prophetic activism. It's not just immoral, it is evil to irreparably harm the future for short-term personal or institutional gain. Yet we have a global economic system supported by governments on every continent and accepted by adherents of every faith, ensuring that it's not only legal to betray posterity, it's profitable, highly profitable. So how do we live? What do we do? And how should we confront what is anti-future and thus evil? In other words, how do we protest and nonviolently resist modern-day structural, organizational, and institutional, that is, legal, evil? One of the most potent quotes from Teddy Goldsmith, he says, It's an astonishing thought that we can completely destroy this planet, make it uninhabitable, and, ass and assure the extinction of our species and countless others without violating a single law. That's what... Gandhi was about. That's what Martin Luther King Jr. was about, confronting legal evil. That's what Christians, pro-future people who are committed to the saving of the future and redeeming humanity, that's what it's about. A church uh, near uh, Atlanta had this picture of Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, autobiography with Gandhi in the background, and I took a picture of it. Integrity, that is right relationship to reality. It's the only path to right relationship to reality. I see Christ as integrity incarnate. And the quote there is, when your character is built on a spiritual and moral foundation, your contagious way of life will influence millions. Now I can only hope. So we're seeing the return of prophets, not people channeling otherworldly entities, not people predicting the future, but people seeing what's real, Acknowledging what's coming and then speaking a word of warning to the people that basically, folks, this is what reality is telling us. James Hansen is a modern day prophet. And here one of the most respected scientists on climate for decades is repeatedly and regularly getting arrested. And when I say repeatedly and regularly, I mean it. <laughs> now, why this level of activism? Well, he himself says why. It's because of his children and grandchildren. These these protests are what do we call civil resistance uh, in the same way that Gandhi did. We're trying to draw attention to the injustice because this this is really analogous. This this is a moral issue, analogous to that faced by Lincoln with slavery or by Churchill with uh, Nazism. Because what we have here is a tremendous case of 
intergenerational injustice because we are causing the problem but our children and grandchildren are going to suffer the consequences and our parents didn't know that they were causing a problem for future generations but we do the science has become very clear and we're going to have to move to a clean energy future and we could do that and there would be many other advantages of doing it why don't we do it because of the special interests and because of the role of money in washington this is one of the reasons why campaign finance reform is so vital so i keep a picture of my granddaughter isla by my desk she's the future calling me to do what i can and i love this quote from jonas salt our greatest responsibility is to be good ancestors. So we often think of a God's eye view of the world as the view from above and outside it all. But I suggest to you that that's a trivial understanding. That's not an ecotheist understanding. This too is a God's eye view of the world, the view from within every set of eyes. The eyes of the future are looking back at us and they're praying for us to see beyond our own time they are kneeling with hands clasped, that we might act with restraint, that we might leave room for the life that is destined to come. I love this quote from Paul Hawken. There is a rabbinical teaching that says that if you're told the world is ending and the Messiah has arrived, first plant a tree, then see if the story is true. So to just recap, we first covered how nested ecotheism untrivializes God guidance, gospel, good and evil, and then took a look at the evolutionary purpose of religion and religious necessity of science. We just took a look at big green history, the cosmic 101 year timeline and what reality is telling us or what I'm suggesting reality is telling us is inevitable, futile. And what does it mean to be a Christian in this context? So this last little 10 minute section or so is going to be on the death and resurrection of faith that is unnatural versus undeniable Christianity. And then 10 commandments to avoid extinction and redeem humanity. And this is really about the difference between unnatural religion or make-believe faith versus undeniable religion or factual faith. See, make-believe faith is I'll make it if I just believe. It's human-centered, it's otherworldly, it's anti-future, it's anti-nature, and it's all about me. It's the cult of the individual. Whereas undeniable religion, factual faith, is God-centered, reality-centered. It's this-worldly. It's pro-future. It's pro-nature. And it's Christian. This goes way beyond where liberal and progressive religion has gone. These We, we typically focus on these things. And, well, we should. These are absolutely vital issues of sustainability, justice, and yet all of these are merely symptoms of ecological overshoot, which is itself caused by human-centeredness, human-centered hubris, idolatry, both religious idolatry and secular idolatry. Religiously, a trivial, limited, finite, that is an unreal and otherworldly notion of God, leads us to treat the living world, God's living presence, as merely an it to be exploited, but also a secular God that is seeing progress or technology or the market as our ultimate concern, our, our ultimate priority. This is, these are secular forms of idolatry. An ecological overshoot is fundamentally a religious failure, always. Coming back to a quote similar to the one I had earlier from Thomas Berry, our difficulty is that we have become spiritually autistic. We no longer listen to what the earth, its landscape and climate, its mountains and valleys, and all the flora and fauna of the planet are telling us. See, it matters how we think of God. In fact, nothing matters more. So whether we spell God with all caps the way I'm doing here, or with small caps, or the old English spelling, or just normal, G-O-D, you know, just the way you normally hear it, I see that the reason I'm spelling it differently is because God spelt normally, oftentimes people immediately think of an otherworldly clockmaker, which is a ecocidal, trivial, impotent understanding of God. I mean, if you, can, if you look at this and don't see God's living presence, God's blue-green presence, then you're blind. And idolatry, that is anthropocentrism or human-centeredness, always leads to ecological overshoot followed by societal simplification, that is a, 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 a collapse of complexity, and population reduction. And here's the thing. There are no counterexamples. In the history of humanity, there are no counterexamples. 
So the myth of the so-called supernatural. Uh, Benson Saylor wrote uh, back in the mid to late 70s, 1977, supernatural as a Western category. And a number of books, James Hillman famously talked about the necessity of personification for understanding the world's myths and religions. Faces in the Clouds, back in 1992, Oxford University Press by Stuart Guthrie, is now the foundation of an entire research discipline known as evolutionary religious studies. Um, Religion is Not About God by Loyal Rue. The Way, an Ecological Worldview by Teddy Goldsmith, and perhaps most profoundly, Supernatural as Natural, a biocultural approach to religion. And it turns out that the supernatural is no more um, uh, unnatural than our dreams. I mean, when we fly in our dreams, we're not having a supernatural experience. We're having an experience common to the dream state. It's inherently natural. Yet, if interpreted literally, supernatural means unnatural. For example, Think about it. Anything that's supposedly supernatural is by definition unnatural. And unnatural beliefs versus undeniable knowledge. I mean, does this sound like the gospel, the good news to you? An unnatural king who occasionally engages in unnatural acts, you know, supernatural interventions, sends his unnatural son to the earth in an unnatural way. He's born through an unnatural birth, lives an unnatural life, performing all sorts of unnatural deeds, and is killed naturally. He then unnaturally raises from the dead in order to redeem us from an unnatural curse brought about by an unnaturally talking snake. After 40 days of unnatural appearances to some of his followers, he unnaturally zooms off to heaven to return to his unnatural father, sit on an unnatural throne, and to unnaturally judge the living and the dead. And if you profess to believe in all this unnatural activity, you and your fellow believers get to go to an unnaturally boring place for an unnaturally long period of time, while everyone else suffers an unnatural, torturous hell forever. Is that what the gospel has been reduced to? I suggest no. It's infinitely more real than that. So I want to just take a very quick look. And in my longer programs, when I have like two hours to do two programs or, you know, two and a half to three hours to do three programs, I go into this in great depth. I'm just, just barely touching on this here. This is the difference between a human-centered versus God or life-centered interpretations of core Christian concepts. And we could do the same thing for every religion. I suggest that every religion, Buddhism, Hinduism, Shintoism, Taoism, Confucianism, uh, Islam, Judaism, every religion... The core insights of that religion can be interpreted in a human-centered way, or, which is anti-future ultimately, or a life-centered way. So here's just some of the ones in Christianity. So I mentioned God, obviously reality with a personality. But again, what I'm talking about also is the real presence and guidance of the past, the present, and the future. So for example, I don't experience the Trinity, or I don't think about the Trinity as three supernatural beings who reside outside the universe. The creator, first person of the Trinity, is the past deified, the past personified. That's where all the creativity of the universe happened and whatever brought this universe into being. So an I-thou personal relationship to the past is, the, is a personal relationship to the first person of the Trinity. What is the only child of the past? What, is the, what does the past give birth to? Why is it that all of our talk of Messiah, Savior, uh, it's all about the future? And so the, the future personified, the future deified, the voice of the future is the voice of Christ. When I say I've asked Christ to be my Lord and Savior, what I mean is I've asked the future incarnate, the future personified, to be the guiding principle of my life. There's nothing otherworldly. And of course, as the Hebrews did, the present personified, the wind and the breath personified. The only place you can experience wind and the only experience, place you can experience breath is in the present moment. So for me, the Trinity is inescapably real. We talk uh, theologically of God's being all-knowing, all-powerful, all-loving. Well, if you think of a supernatural being who has these characteristics, that's trivial compared to power personified, power deified. All the power of the universe is God's power. All the knowledge of the universe, all the wisdom inherent in every living being is included in what we mean by omniscience. Uh, all love is God's love. Again, this is not about beliefs. This is about knowledge. Idolatry. I've talked about this already very briefly. Idolatry isn't bowing down to statues and it's not believing in the wrong God. Idolatry is human centeredness. It's anthropocentrism. It's having an unreal notion of God, a divinity that's not synonymous with reality. 
It's failing to honor the living God, the ecosphere, as primary, and that we are derivative. We emerge out of the body of life, and primary reality will be honored as primary or we will perish. It's taking primary reality for granted, that is, taking the soil, the forest, the water, the climate upon which we depend for granted. Idolatry is having an ultimate authority that leads us to degrade or defile primary reality, that is, God's nature, God's living presence, and thus betray future generations. Idolatry of the written word, idolatry of the otherworldly, and idolatry of beliefs are three of the primary forms within the uh, monotheistic traditions of idolatry. Idolatry of the written word is where we think God's best guidance, that is our best map of reality, is frozen in time in some ancient text. Idolatry of the otherworldly is where we think where God resides is only outside time and nature rather than also incarnate, revealed within time and nature. And idolatry of beliefs is when we privilege beliefs over knowledge, what God's been revealing through evidence for centuries. But there are secular forms of idolatry. Idolatry of growth, idolatry of progress, human-centered progress, idolatry of the market. Idolatry of reason, that is, imagining factual truth over practical truth. And this idea of man, conqueror of nature, will be seen as the single most ecocidal, suicidal, crazy, uh, unsustainable belief system in the history of humanity. It's idolatry. The fall and original sin. I do whole programs on this. Uh, outside Eden, that is outside the Garden of Eden, speaking mythically, outside the Pleistocene uh, for two and a half million years, outside of that, the last eight, 10,000 years, our instincts are killing us. And my first TEDx talk uh, in 2012 was on why we struggle and suffer. Um, because it's not because our great-great-grandmother, you know, ate an apple. We struggle, we suffer, we self-destruct. That is how and why we betray reality and dishonor our own inner, outer, and social nature is because we have mismatched instincts and we live in a world of supernormal allurements. I mean, think about all the things that we and our children and our grandchildren struggle with and are tempted by. It's not just our personal issues. So many of our collective problems have this mismatched understanding of instincts. This, the fact that we don't live in a world uh, like we did in the garden where our instincts serve us just like every other animal. Uh, our instincts are mismatched. And the Apostle Paul said it very powerfully, mythically, but very powerfully. He said, I'm a slave to sin. I really don't understand myself. I have the desire to do what is good, but I don't do it. What I end up doing is not the good I want to do, but what I hate to do. What a wretched man am I. History will show that one of the greatest psychological and spiritual revelations or realizations of the 20th century was the discovery that human beings have powerful, indeed compelling instincts, just like all other animals do. And that if we don't humble ourselves before primary reality, that is the living God, the ecosphere, prioritize the future, that is live in Christ, and respect, that is honor and harness our inherited drives, we are bound to be enslaved to them. So again, Christ as the way, the truth, and the life, integrity, or making the future Lord is our only way to live in right relationship to reality. Salvation, redemption. I, I think of prayer as the posture and attitude of humility and gratitude. Heaven and hell, Christ return, judgment day. I mean, there will be a judgment day. Make no, no doubt about it. The future will judge us. Your great-grandchildren will judge you. Judgment day is real. It's just not otherworldly. Every time any tradition speaks of God said this or God did that, what follows is always an interpretive personification. That is, reality is doing something, and then it's interpreted on what God is saying or doing. And it's only our inability to read mythic literature that's made us blind and deaf to what God or reality has been revealing now for centuries. So I'll conclude on, thus saith the Lord, these are 10 commandments to redeem humanity. The first having to do with idolatry. Stop thinking of me as anything less than the voice of undeniable, inescapable reality. Stop thinking of revelation, divine instruction, or God's word apart from evidence. Again, this is reality speaking. And I've, I've, what I've done is I've spent a year and a half uh, going through these with uh, scholars all over, religious and science scholars, and basically discerning. We need collective intelligence. Is this what reality is telling us? 
Stop thinking of your sacred creation story apart from the history of the universe. Stop thinking of theology apart from ecology, the interdisciplinary study of my nature. Stop defining and measuring progress in short-term human-centered ways. Stop allowing the free or subsidized polluting of the commons. Stop using renewable resources faster than they can be replenished. Stop using non-renewable resources in ways that harm or rob future generations. Stop exploring for coal, oil, and natural gas. Keep most of it in the ground. And stop prioritizing the wants of the wealthy over the needs of the poor. I created a 17-minute YouTube where there's like two paragraphs for each of those. And again, this is, reflects collective intelligence of science and religion scholars all over the world. Uh, I actually was interacting with about 120 different scholars. Um, and you can, if you just put realities rules, 10 commandments to avoid extinction, you'll get a little 17-minute YouTube video. I want to conclude with a quote from Gil Bailey. It was not those closest to the historical Jesus who first gave the gospel its geographical breadth and theological depth. It was Paul, who had never known him. Likewise, impressive achievements in biblical scholarship have given those of us alive today a richer appreciation of what it means to follow Jesus than was available, say, to the Gentile Christians of the second century. If the life and death of Jesus is historically and mythically central, then people living 10,000 years from now will be in a better position to appreciate that than we are. Furthermore, when they look back, they will surely think of us as early Christians, living as we do a scant two millennia from the mysterious events in question. They will be right, for the Christian movement today is still in the elementary stages of working out for itself and for the world the implications of the gospel. It may be only at rare moments that this flawed and unlikely thing that we call the church even remotely resembles something worthy of its calling, but is nonetheless embarked on a great Christological adventure. Even against its own institutional resistances, it is continually finding deeper and more far-reaching implications to the Jesus story. I consider these six fundamental principles that unite tens of millions of people, secular and religious, around the world. Reality is our God. Evidence is our scripture. Big history, big green history is our creation story. Ecology is our theology. Integrity is our spiritual path. And a just and healthy future is our mission. Another world is not only possible, she is on her way. Maybe many of us won't be here to greet her, but on a quiet day, if I listen very carefully, I can hear her breathing. Science is at least in part informed worship. So here's an overview of what I covered in this uh, hour and 20 minute program. Again, when I speak in live audiences, I take out some of these slides. It's usually closer to an hour. And here are questions for reflection and discussion. And I'm more than happy to be on a Skype call if there's a group of people that studies this. Here's our main websites, thegreatstory.org and michaeldowd.org, and my contact information.